This is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty. I guess this afternoon, Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and we're simply talking about the, his books, uh, the, which we carry. And of course, the one that's in print at the present time is called The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan. And you must understand that the Nazi movement did not end uh, certainly with the end of the Second World War, because of course, the American intelligence, British intelligence, and a small satanic se segment within the Vatican helped the Nazis escape, not only to South America, but to the Muslim countries. Well, certainly, the, um, the, our intelligence agencies brought a thousand Nazis to the United States where they worked in the space program. They've worked on developing new and horrible diseases. They've worked certainly on mind control, and these programs are being implemented today. But the Nazi movement is intact throughout the world. And what is so difficult for most people to understand or believe is that certainly American corporations and American banks finance the Nazis not only before World War II, but during World War II, but don't take my word for it. Go up on the internet and look up uh, Prescott Bush. Prescott Bush uh, indicted Nazi supporting Nazis. Indicted supporting Nazis. You'll find out that the president, uh, the, uh, the, the father of a president, the grandfather of another president, was indicted in 1942 for his aid to the Nazi movement. But it didn't end in 1942. It continued on. Nothing as it appears to be. Reality is usually scoffed at. Illusion is usually king. You need to get the book written by a man and, uh, who actually had a, the, one of the highest security ratings in the, the, in the Justice Department. And it's his book, America's Nazi Secret by John Loftus, available to our ministry and many of the other books, but certainly The Power Leaf and The Secret Nazi Plan by Dr. Cuddy will tell you the things and verify and give you the sources where you can check it out. And if it's true, that most of what you've believed all of your life is. And if you want to know what happened to Adolf Hitler, the book, uh, Grey Wolf, very interesting, but go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, let me spend a little time on the things that you just said. Uh, yeah, uh, Grey Wolf is a, a very good book by uh, two, two individuals. Uh, they looked at a lot of primary documents, did a lot of interviews in South America, and uh, I've heard that it's supposed to be coming out with a movie uh, uh, based on that. And uh, in, in addition, uh, another couple of individuals, and you can find this uh, written up in the Jerusalem Post, uh, besides those two, another couple of individuals did their own uh, documentary uh, using a lot of the same material as Grey Wolf, but a lot of different material, some new material as well interviewing some different people in South America and elsewhere. So hold, that both... thought, hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and certainly Dr. Cuddy was simply talking about uh, the fact that little-known fact here in America, you're supposed to believe that Adolf Hitler died in a bunker in Berlin, and thus bunk. Basically, of course, uh, Adolf Hitler and the Martin Bormann, the Nazis, were helped to escape to South America. And there's all sorts of books on that, but a recent book, Grey Wolf going to the background of Adolf of Hitler. And uh, t I, I interviewed, actually, the gentleman, one of the gentlemen who wrote the book, who'd gone with his partner down to South America and talked to the people and interviewed the people who knew and took care of Adolf Hitler after he escaped. But you have to understand that the Nazi movement was largely financed from America uh, by American banks, 10 American banks, including Brown Brothers Harriman, which was led by a man named Prescott Bush, and another man named this is the, um, uh, George Herbert Walker. George Herbert Walker, for whom George Herbert Walker Bush was named. They were the, uh, certainly two of the members of the board of Brown Brothers Harriman, but we can't let the American people know they're supposed to believe what they learned in school, most of which was bunk. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Yeah, and it's, it, <clears throat> it's really sort of bad. Uh, somebody thinks, well, okay, so there's this one Bush guy who did some banking transactions, and that's it. But it, it, you have to understand, as part of the power elite, it was more vast than, than even that. 
because, uh, for example, uh, Ernst Rudin, uh, R-U-D-I-N, and I put this in my book, uh, the Sacred Nazi Plan book, uh, was one of the primary eugenicists. Uh, he actually had a column about eugenics in Margaret Sanger's uh, Birth Control uh, Review. Uh, and uh, he was, like I said, Hitler's primary individual. They were picking up on population control from Margaret Sanger and her birth control movement, which was largely promoted by the Rockefellers. So, you know, say it's not just that Hitler comes up with his eugenic plan. He's getting a lot of it from us, including funding from the Rockefeller through Margaret Sanger, and then Ernst Rudin writes a, a long article in her publication uh, for that. And what happened to Ernst? What he all? What he got to do with the Bushes? Well, he was transported to these meetings, like International Eugenics Conference, on the Hamburg American Line, a shipping line. And you know, the, here here we have the the Bushes and so forth involved in this these shipping enterprises. And they didn't own the line, but they were you know heavily into those things. So there's all this interconnection. And to show how the dialectical process works, and that's what I, I explained in the front of my book, how the, the people who funded the communists were also funding the Nazis. And I had mentioned previously about Nelson Rockefeller working with the Nazis and David Rockefeller working with the communists. The same sort of thing applies to the, the Bushes in, in this sense. Uh, Prescott Sheldon Bush, who Dr. Stan just talked about, Union Banking Corporation and the conduits of the Nazis in the 1940s, and how he was, uh, you know, convicted of this. Uh, no, he, he was, wasn't convicted, he was indicted. But okay, they, I, yeah. They, okay. They, but basically, of course, anybody can check that out on the internet. Check this, ladies and gentlemen. Don't take what Dr. Cuddy and I say. Check it out for yourself, and when you find out it's true, then say, how could that be? Why? How could the American people never been told the truth? We'll go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Okay. Uh, so anyway, there were there were charges for which they said uh, he, he you know we got the goods and I, I thought he paid a fine or something like that. It, 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 there was something. So anyway, what happened was Prescott Sheldon Bush uh, was of the class Yale University Skull and Bones class uh, 1917, and in that same cla uh, class was uh, H R Mallon, uh, Mal Agent, pardon me, Agent Mallon, M A L L O N. And uh, that individual, his classmate, is the one in the late 40s who uh, would give George Herbert Walker Bush his first job down in the Texas oil field. Now, why am I bringing all that up? Because it's like part of the dialectic. Uh, what would happen is uh, Prescott Sheldon Bush would be helping the Nazis in, in the 40s and, and before. And uh, so that's on the one side. Now, what was Malin doing? Who was a you know fellow Skull and Bones member, and had helped uh, Prescott's son George H. W. Bush in his uh, first job down in Texas in the oil field. Well, uh, I try to put a lot of primary documents in my work, and so uh, I have in one of my earlier books, I actually put a letter in there, 1958, by a Sid S. I. D. Harden H. A. R. D. I. N. I put an actual photostat of the letter itself. And a woman, I'm not going to give her name, from Texas mailed this to me um, years ago. And she knew this uh, Sid Harden. He was a lawyer and a talk show host. And so he was writing a letter back to this woman, who I know. And he was saying, you know, here's about the show and your questions and thanks for calling. You know, all of that sort of general interest. And then the bottom one-third of the letter, you'll see the actual letter. He has this long thing that says confidential, confidential. And what he says after that in this long paragraph is all about this fellow Malin. He says, Naval Intelligence came to me, to Sid Harden, and wanted all my material, my files, on Malin. And he said, why? Well, they're, they're asking all sorts of questions about this guy. And what were the questions that said, well, it seems like he has something to do with the communists and the Soviet Union activities in Cuba and so forth. Now, remember... This is in 1958, when this is a really, really hot topic, and Fidel Castro hadn't quite assumed power yet, and therefore the public in general didn't know that he was a communist. Now, you know, the people in our government knew Castro was a communist, and, you know, the newspaper elite, the New York Times and all them covered it up that he was a communist, but the public didn't. However, this guy has these documents, and that's what naval intelligence is already investigating. 
They're really concerned about this fellow Malin and his association with these various communist entities like the Soviet Union and Cuba and so forth. So on the one hand, you have his classmate, Skull and Bones, Yale University, the class 1917, Skull and Bones, uh, uh, Malin, the classmate of Prescott Bush, and Prescott's helping the Nazis in the 40s, and Malin apparently, at least if you believe the naval intelligence, is looking into his working with, in some capacity, the communists. And that's how they play the dialectic. That's how the dialectic works. You know, you play both sides there. Well, of course, uh, my uh, plea with people is get David Rockefeller's memoirs, go to the bank and uh, go to the, uh, sort of the library and get it, but to read David Rockefeller's memoirs about how his daughters go down to visit Fidel. They think Fidel is just the greatest guy, and Fidel comes up to visit David. Why would David Rockefeller's uh, so the daughters be going down to, to visit this wicked man who's guilty of multiple murders, uh, hundreds of personal murders, and and why would he, David Rockefeller, even talk to this man? Well, of course, you need to read the book to find that out, and then, of course, we have a wonderful interview with the, uh, Ambassador Earl Smith, who was the American ambassador to Cuba in 1959 when we brought Fidel Castro to power. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we installed Fidel Castro. Uh, and, of course, Ambassador Smith, and you'll hear him telling me, well, we knew Fidel was a Castro. I knew, the President knew, Henry Kissinger knew, the State Department knew, the FBI knew. Everybody knew he was a communist. Now, why would we be installing communism? Why, for the same reason we funded communism since its inception. For the same reason we funded the Nazis. For the same reason we're funding the Al-Qaeda terrorists in the Syria today. The best enemy that money could buy. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, okay, well, let, let me then uh, pick up on that, because uh, that, that leads me to uh, something else uh, which is uh, really important. Uh, most people look at David Rockefeller and they, they look at the memoirs and part of a, he's always admits he's part of a secret cabal conspiring against the best interests of the United States for a more integrated global political and economic structure. And you say, oh, okay, I understand. He's a big shot, lots of money, and so forth and so on. Well, it's actually more planned and specific than that. For example, what Dr. Sands just said, out the translation of that is Fidel Castro owes just about everything to Rockefeller. It's, it's not just the U.S., it's Rockefeller. And that's why they're still buddies, because Rockefeller was a, a big supporter. Rockefeller could have blown the whistle. Rockefeller could have denied access and funding and all that. So David Rockefeller sort of quietly, sort of quietly, is largely responsible for a lot of people being in power, and a lot of people being out of power. For example, in the early 60s, Khrushchev was supposed to be a big shot in the, in the Soviet Union. And he's, you know, slamming his, his uh, heel on the UN uh, table, you know, bang, bang, bang. And, you know, he's a real tough uh, head of the Soviet Union, so on and so on. All right. Not too long after that, David Rockefeller makes a quiet visit to the Soviet Union. <laughs> A quiet visit, and he has a chat. Now, David Rockefeller's got lots of things to do. So if he's going to make a trip to the Soviet Union, you got to figure this means something. You know, this is not just, hey, I, you know, I have nothing better to do than go to the Black Sea for a weekend. You know, it's not, it's not one of that. So David goes over there, and shortly thereafter, uh, Khrushchev is sort of, sort of vacationing, you know, a little bit. And the next thing you know, Khrushchev is wondering, what happened to me? He's, he's, Sent off to Siberia. <laughs> you know, they actually know. sent Khrushchev to Siberia to <laughs> yeah. manage, manage a, nuke, a power plant in Siberia. And who is more powerful in Russia than Khrushchev? We right. Remember the pictures of him pounding his shoe on the podium? I remember those. And he was this, but it's all an act, ladies and gentlemen. When David Rockefeller took the trip over there to uh, to Russia, and it was a weekend, uh, uh, Khrushchev was down vacationing in the Black Sea, and he came back from the Black Sea, and he found he'd been replaced. Who is powerful enough to replace the dictator of, of Russia? Well, I think we have a pretty good idea. All you need to do is read page 405 of David Rockefeller's uh, memoirs, where he talks about the secret cabal he's working about. He's a member of, he's working, he says, of working against the best interests of the United States, conspiring with others, that's his word, with others around the world to bring about a more 
uh, affects the, the geopolitical, uh, geo and political structure. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not imaginary. Read what he says. The book is memoirs available from Radio Liberty by calling 1-800-544-8927. Don't take anything I say for granted. Check it out and find out if it's true. And if it is, then join us while you still can. Dr. Kenny, you go right ahead. Okay, and and to show you uh, once again the thoroughness of all of this, the specificity of all this, uh, let me just pick up on what Dr. Stan said. So it's not just David Rockefeller happened over there. It's not just that, that the timing was critical. It's not just that Khrushchev uh, had gone to vacation to Black Sea and then next thing Khrushchev knows he's in Siberia. There's actually a picture. You know, a picture is you know, worth, a, like I said, a thousand words. But there's a picture. If you go to your library while you're looking up page 405 of David Rockefeller's memoirs, go pick up another thick book over there called The Six Wise Men. The Six Wise Men. And it's, uh, it's by a couple of authors, one of whom uh, is the Rhodes Scholar, the uh, editor, one of the editors of uh, Time magazine. Uh, and there's another one who's uh, uh, Evans, Evans of, of uh, Newsweek, who is managing editor. And I had a little chat with him one time, and that's about 9-11. That's a whole different story. But the point is, in their book, The Six Wise Men, the big, thick book, sort of like Rockefeller's big, thick book about these wise men, they actually have a photograph in there. And the photograph is at the Black Sea, you know, where uh, Khrushchev had gone to vacation. And the picture is, on the Black Sea, right outside of Khrushchev's Dachau, that's his you know, place of rest, what they call it, place of residence there, like a little house. And, and he's there, and he's arm in arm, wrapped around each other's shoulder, with John J. McCloy at the Black Sea. And McCloy is wearing a pair of swimming trunks that Khrushchev loaned him. And you get the, the picture of these are real buddies, you know, real pals, Arms around each other. Isn't that nice? <laughs> I figure. Well, who's McCoy? Well, he's, as I have written many times, many books, he's one of the enforcers, one of the agents of the paralytes. The paralytes, like David Rockefeller, they have these agents. And so John J. McCoy was the primary agent for the, the Rockefellers and others after Colonel Edward Mandel House, who was the agent of the paralytes, uh, uh, attached to Woodrow Wilson. So you have these puppets, you know, these puppets like Woodrow Wilson, and then the apparently places somebody, a very powerful agent like Colonel Edward Mandel House, who basically tells Wilson, you will have a Federal Reserve. You will do this, that, and the other. And uh, shortly thereafter, after the Communist Revolution 1917 over in the Soviet Union, uh, Raymond Robin, who was head of the American Red Cross, uh, he also was an agent of the Paralee. So you got Colonel House telling Woodrow Wilson what to do for the Paralee. And then you have Raymond Robin going over into the Soviet Union and telling Lenin uh, what to do for the Paralee. Uh, Lenin actually has to, you know, say, yes, sir, yes, sir, Mr. Robin, yes, sir, I will get rid of that foreign minister of mine. Uh, the pronunciation is Salk in line or something like that. I I've got it written down. But anyway... Can you imagine anybody telling Lenin, you know, here he is, a successful revolution, a ruthless communist, and here Raymond Robin, the head of the American Red Cross, is bossing him around. I mean, just think, just think of that. So after Colonel House, the next person in line is the primary agent of the paralytic, telling people like FDR and others what to do, uh, was John J. McCoy. In fact, uh, I put in my some of my books, at least two or three, where Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War, under FDR... Hold that thought, hold that thought, we'll be right back. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and Dr. Dr. Cuddy is simply talking about the people who tell the presidents what to do, and he was talking about a man named Ray Robbins, Raymond Robbins, of course, he was over in, in Russia telling Lenin what to do, and uh, basically we actually have some uh, quotations about that in my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, and then along comes Colonel House, and he tells President uh, Woodrow Wilson what to do, you have suddenly people like John McCloy, and he's telling other presidents what to do, and pick the story up there. Yeah, and so uh, McCoy is brought to uh, to Washington uh, to be an assistant to uh, Henry Stimson. 
But Henry Stimson, his boss, uh, I have a quote by Stimson from Stimson's diary where he says, nobody in Washington does anything without having a little talk with McCloy first. So, you know, imagine that. Let's say there's a boss of a corporation. But the boss of the corporation says this guy under him is the one who tells people <laughs> what to do. So here's another clear example where not only did Rockefeller go over and tell the Soviets what to do, his enforcer, his agent, John J. McCloy, is there wrapped around Khrushchev and wearing Khrushchev's swimming trunks and both of them grinning from ear to ear. No, this is covered in the book. It's called The, the Sixth Six Wise, Wise Man. Men. The yeah. Sixth Wise Man. Go, go ahead. Yeah, and you'll see a picture. You'll see a picture of that in there. Uh, another place, <clears throat> while I'm at it, in The Six Wise Men, uh, one of them was a Chip Bolin, B-O-H-L-E-N. He's another one of these uh, agents that you don't hear much about. But uh, he's the one who accompanies FDR. And in this book, The Six Wise Men, it has a passage uh, by Bolin. And Bolin is in 1944 in Tehran. Uh, and, uh, well, in, in that general period, 43-44 in Tehran. And he's recounting, you know, he's recounting in this book his little trip over there uh, with FDR and meeting Stalin. And he says, it's just sort of matter of fact, he says, and Stalin uh, had this uh, chat with, uh, FDR had this chat with Stalin. And FDR said, uh, Joe, you know, uh, we used to call Stalin Uncle Joe. You know, he's our buddy, our ally against the Nazis, Uncle Joe. It says, uh, Joe, uh, uh, there's uh, a deal I want to make with you. He said, now what I'm going to do for you, Joe, is after this war, since we're good buddies, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give this Soviet ruthless dictator, I'll give you mm, Poland and Lithuania and Estonia and Latvia. But, Joe, uh, keep this under your hat, because, see, I'm up for re-election in 40, 1944, and there's a lot of Polish Americans, they wouldn't like this. See, they wouldn't like this deal that I'm doing where I'm giving you, you, you ruthless communist dictator who will probably slaughter anybody you get his hands on in Poland. I'll just give them to you. But keep your mouth shut, Joe, see, because, you know, the Polish might not vote for me, and then I might not get elected, see. So that's how, you know, and this is the guy, FDR, that we've erected a statue to in Washington, in addition to you know, knowing about Pearl Harbor and saying, well, golly shucks, uh, we couldn't let the Japanese know that we had broken the Purple Code. In other words, let all those people in the Arizona and everywhere else get slaughtered. Because we <laughs> so it, well, anyway, so here's this FDR, and basically he is told what to do uh, by John J. McCoy. And so here you have McCoy. He, uh, McCoy in 1936, and I put a picture in my secret Nazi plan book. I have a picture of McCoy sitting with Hitler in his box at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. Now, is that the same McCoy who has yeah. his arm around Kruse yeah, sometime yeah. later? Yeah, yeah. So see how the dialectic works? In 36, he's sitting there with Hitler. You know, they're yucking it up, watching the Olympics in Hitler's box. And then uh, about uh, 26 years later, around 1962-ish in there, there he is with his arms wrapped around his good buddy, the communist, ruthless dictator, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, and wearing his swimming trunks at the Black Sea while David Rockefeller is having the, <laughs> you know, ha has had his little chat with the powers that be, uh, his, his buddies, saying, oh, uh, by the way, you know, while Nikita's there with my, my agent, with their arms wrapped around each other. Uh, when he gets uh, finished with his vacation, uh, send him to Siberia. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, when I went back to his, uh, the Yale University in 1980, the Sterling Library, I went through Henry Stimson's diary. Now, he was the Secretary of War during the Second World War. And there, if you ever want to read it, we actually have it. He tells about certainly going to the White House. It was like the 25th of November, and George Marshall was there. So the, uh, uh, the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, uh, he was there. I think there was one. There were five people, including the President. And he said President Roosevelt told us the attack was coming on Pearl Harbor. It was probably going to come the following Monday. And the only question was how we were going to convince the American people that the Japanese were going to strike us first so we can get into the war. They left those men. They knew the attack was coming. Kimmel wanted to put the fleet to sea. They wouldn't let them. They left them there to be killed. 
just like they left the people in the Twin Towers to be killed. You had to have an incident to get people into the war. If you'd like to see those pages that I copied from Hemi Stinson's diary, we have them. We'll be glad to send them to you. Our number is 1-800-544-8927. Dr. Cuddy, you go right ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, and like I said, uh, FDR was basically told what to do. And uh, McCloy was the enforcer, the agent of the paralegal who was uh, telling him what to do. And like Dr. Stan said uh, in the, his diary, November 25th, he says, I've just come out of a meeting with FDR, and we're seeing how we can maneuver Japan into firing the first shot, because what they really want to do was get into war with Germany, and Japan was an ally of Germany, so once you get into a war with Japan, you're automatically into a, uh, a war with uh, Germany as well. And so they, they were maneuvering, and they actually followed, and I put a picture of this, just like I put a picture of the Sid Harden letter in one of my books. In my book, The Globalist, I actually put a, a picture of the plan that FDR used. It was drafted, I think, by a naval lieutenant or a lieutenant commander or something. It's like 10 points, and it's like type. The actual type on his typewriter, you'll see it there. Point number one, we do this, this, you know, blockade Japan so they can't get any oil, blah, blah, blah. And they actually 10 points, and so that was the plan that FDR was following in order to maneuver uh, Japan into uh, firing the first shot. And I also put, you know, other things. I put a, a specific passage uh, by a, a fellow who's a, a Dutch fellow, uh, named, I think it was Dutch, uh, Dutch or Norwegian, I think it was Dutch, uh, named Renief, and he's there. And this, the Renief is, they, you know, they have their own system of intelligence. And he's actually, his account is, well, I'm looking at this map, and there's these little pins on there. And he says, I asked the, the U.S. naval fellow, whatever his rank was, well, what are those little pins there? And the naval fellow, this is just before Pearl Harbor, the naval fellow told me, this is the fellow named Rudy, he says, oh, that's the movement of the Japanese fleet. They're coming towards Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Rudy says, oh, really? Oh, I see. The Japanese fleet is coming to Pearl Harbor. Now, remember, this is before December 7th, the attack. So here, here he's looking at this Dutch officer, looking at this map of this naval officer actually tracking the Japanese fleet movement from Japan to Pearl Harbor. So there's that's just tons of this. Not tons. Hold that thought. Of- Hold that thought. We'll be back here in just a moment. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and because you have to understand that most of what you have heard and what you've been taught in school isn't true, and most of the books you read are true, because, of course, there's six major corporations that control 90% of the major uh, media outlets in the United States and largely determine what the American people think and believe, and they've all got interlocking directorates, and they all tie into what I call the Brotherhood of Darkness. Well, I guess is Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and if you haven't read his books, let me suggest you get his book, The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan. We have his book of, uh, on quotations. We have his book, certainly, on, on the open conspiracy. You can call our 800 number, one 800 544 and we have all the books that are in print, and I wish they were all in print. A wonderful source of information, but of course you're not to have that information. And Well, anyway, let's go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, uh, and a lot of the books are like, uh, not a lot, but uh, about half or so are out of print. They, they usually sell pretty well. In fact, I wish I had some of that last book I mentioned, The Globalist, because uh, the other day I looked on uh, Amazon. And on Amazon, I think like the cheapest thing, uh, price you can pay for the globalist, a new copy, you get used copies, a new copy was $134. And then there was another copy of the globalist on Amazon that was selling for $541. And then there was another copy of the globalist, a new copy on Amazon that was selling for $2,000. I don't know if they got that, but somebody thought they could get $2,000 for the globalist. So that. That's a really important book. I mean, I, I think all my books are important. But I do try to include a lot of information and a lot of primary, like, visuals. Like, okay, here's the actual letter from Sid Hart. Here's the actual naval commander's list of ten points that FDR used to get Japan into a position, to maneuver Japan into a position of firing the first shot. So I try to, I try to do all of that. 
And now, uh, before I get back to the news reviews column about, will Israel attack Iran, uh, with the end of part three, I'll just mention that the new book uh, is uh, titled, again, The Power Elite, subtitled, uh, Their History and Future. And what I've done is, you'll, you'll see it, it's going to be a light yellow sort of cover, but it'll be like a, a vibrant uh, red title. The title will be in red. Underneath that, of course, the bottom of the page, my name is in black. But the, the visual on the cover this time, we, I try, we try to have really good visuals on the cover, and you have to keep it simple. There will actually be uh, the publisher has a really good uh, artist there, and what they've done is created their own version of what's on the cover of The Economist magazine for January 9, 1988, uh, which is the phoenix, like the bird, the phoenix. And the reason that's there is uh, because the planned world currency is for 2018, and the phoenix, of course, according to mythology, rises from the ashes. So this will be the phoenix world currency rising from the economic ashes, which are coming really soon. Now, basically what Dr. Cuddy is really saying, and uh, in essence, is there's going to be a financial collapse. Yep. I think he's absolutely right. And basically the whole idea is they want a one-world government, a one-world financial system, and a one-world religion. Well, how do you get a one-world financial system? You destroy the old one. And of course, you end up impoverishing the people. Oh, well, the Americans have their money in pension funds and nothing to worry about. Yeah, the pension funds are invested in bonds. Why, of course, the bonds aren't worth the paper they're printed on, that people have the annuities. Uh, everything is wiped out. Everything is wiped out that's actually attached to dollars and mediated in dollars. But that's how we'll get this new world currency, and people will be desperate for stability. They know exactly what they're doing. They just don't want you to know until it's too late. You go to a financial advisor. He's going to tell you to invest in stocks and bonds and annuities, and, and he gets a permit. He gets a, a a certainly a benefit from that. He gets a commission on it for giving you advice that will end up getting you impoverished. There is a plan. Destroy the value of our currency, and it's coming and coming very soon. Dr. Kelly, go right ahead. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's all laid out. It's a, a specific timetable. And uh, as I said, the cover of The Economist for January 9th, 1988, has a picture of this. And so on the cover of my book, the artist is, uh, is very good. And they 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 didn't just you know take a picture and put it there. They actually have a really good-looking artistic gold coin with a a different. It's the phoenix bird is on there, but it's a, a different thing than looks than is on the cover of the Economist. But you, you'll see it, and they they've got the letters and words World Phoenix, and then you know on the other side of the tail of the Phoenix 2018, because that's when the plan is. The the Economist magazine said. The title of their article was Pencil in the Phoenix for 2018. And that's 30 years in advance, you know, 1988, 2018. But that, that's the timetable. They're still on schedule. And the way the schedule works is that uh, this year will be sort of okay, but then things will not, not do all that well, but still, you know, no collapse yet in 2014. And then in 2015, uh, the sort of handwriting will be right over the around the corner, over the wall, and then by 2016, we'll be going on our slide really downhill. And uh, everybody will say, ooh, you know, this is horrible. And even Barack Obama might say, gee, I wish I had not been elected. You know, why didn't I let uh, Romney or Hillary have this disaster? Because it's planned. You know, it's planned. And so uh, the next, uh, and, and I'm not going to go too much of this because I've already been in it. It'll be in this book that I've got coming out about three weeks, this, this, this scenario will be in there and how Jeb Bush is planned for election in 20, uh, November 2016. He'll take office 2017, and he will supposedly try valiantly to, you know, turn the tide, but golly shucks, he won't be able to. So the next year, 2018, he'll say, gee whiz, you know, I wish we didn't have to, but hey, these things happen, and we'll be into the, uh, the world currency. And so uh, that's the cover of the, uh, the book that I've got uh, coming out. It, sh it should be. In about three weeks, and that's the, the colors and the lettering and, and so forth. And so I, I would urge all of the listeners to Radio Liberty to uh, get that as well. Okay, now in the last uh, 15 to 20 minutes, let me at least pick up on where I was last time. So at the end of part three, 
of will Israel attack Iran? And what I'm doing. Well, basically, of course, this article is is in, uh, uh, is published in, in News with Views. News with Views. Right. Go ahead. All right. I have a series of four part series, and we're now at the end of part three on will Israel attack Iran. Uh, but I, as usual, I don't just deal with, okay, here's Israel and here's Iran, and they attack or they don't attack. I try and place it in the larger context. And so what I ended with at the end of part three is how a W.J. Gint, G-H-E-N-T, has a book and an article, and I was quoting from his article called The Next Step, A Benevolent Feudalism. And that's published in a newspaper called The Independent, dated April 3, 1902. Now, he also has a, a companion book, you know, it's larger. But this is very important. It's not just, oh, look, you know, Cuddy found a quote by some guy. This guy was the editor of the American Fabian magazine, Fabian meaning Fabian Socialism, and that's what the power elite want. Through a gradual process, Fabian, that's the slow process, they want a world socialist government. So that's why this fellow is particularly important. And not that's not just my opinion, but Jack London wrote a book in 1907 called The Iron Heel. The Iron Heel, H-E-E-L. And in there he said, Gent's model, this guy, Gent's model, is what the oligarchs and plutocrats are going to use in the future to achieve their ultimate objective of, you know, world control. So Jack London is agreeing, you know, he's agreeing, and this is like 100 years ago, so over 100 years ago, where they're mapping out this plan. And so where we were last time was uh, describing what happens not only to the nations uh, that are involved in this in-time sort of scenario, but individuals. And I was quoting from Gent's article in The Independent, which is called The Next Step of Benevolent Feudalism. And I'm not going to go back over the whole quote, but I'm just going to pick up in the middle where he's, he's talking about this, this uh, society to come, this feudalistic socialism to come. And what happens to individuals is what he's describing now. And I'm picking up in the middle of the quote where he says, the individual security of place and livelihood of its members, the society, will then depend on the harmony of their utterances, you know, what they say, and acts, A-C-T-S, with the wishes of the great nobles. See, in a feudalistic society, you got these serfs and peasants, and nobles and names, knaves at the bottom, and at the top you got your, your nobles, your dukes and your earls and marquises and all that sort of stuff. And so again, continues, and he says, and so long as they rightly fulfill their functions, you know, that's the serfs, as long as you obey... As long as you obey the nobles, you know, the elite, he says, there, the people, the masses, their recompense will be generous. See, so if you do what David Rockefeller wants you to do, you'll be okie-dokie. You'll, 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 you'll be okay. And then again continues, he says, they will, they will at once be the assuagers of popular suspicion. See, when this stuff happens, people start getting suspicious. You know, I wonder what's going on. Maybe... Maybe in Rockefeller or there's some sort of conspiracy. So he says there are people in place who are at once the assuagers of popular suspicion and discontent and the providers of moral and intellectual anodynes for the barren. So you have people assuaging the public. They calm down. You know, don't be suspicious. Everything's okay. Don't be discontented. You know, there are people in place to handle that. And again, continues. He says, a host of economists, preachers, and editors will be ready to show indisputably that the revolution, that I'm pardon, pardon me, that the evolution taking place is for the best interest of all. See, so there's economists and preachers and editors saying it's okay. This is all going to be for the best. So again, continues. He says, the nobles of this you know, future to, to come, uh, the nobles will have attained to complete power, and the motive and operation of government will have become simply the registering and administering of their, their, not ours, their collective will. Armed force will, of course, he says, be employed to overawe the uh, discontented and to quiet unnecessary turbulence. Unlike the armed forces of the old feudalism, you know, a thousand years ago, the knights and the, you know, jousting and the crossbows and all that stuff. He says, unlike the armed forces of the old feudalism, the nominal control 
will be that of the state, the, the nominal control, but it's actually the nobles, you know, the powerless. The nominal control will be that of the state. He continues, when the new order is in full swing, so comprehensive and so exact will be the social and political control that it will be exercised in a constantly widening scope. They, they, they have this control, and then he widened it, and widened it, and widened it. And so uh, he continues. He says, peace and stability will be the main desideratum. You know, that's what they'll tell us. All these editors and preachers, we need peace. We need stability. Just go along. It'll be okay. All right, so he again continues. He says, a happy blending of generosity and firmness will characterize all dealings with open discontent. In other words, they don't just come and beat you over the head. You know, we're gonna, we'll be generous. Just go along with us. Of course, you do need to go along or there might be cost, you know, like that. So it's a generous, uh, but firm. All right, so he goes on. He says, a happy blending of generosity and firmness will characterize all dealings with open discontent. To the prevention of discontent, the teachings of the schools and colleges, the sermons, the editorials, and even the plays, P-L-A-Y-S, plays at the theater will be skillfully and persuasively bolded. So here you see the vast control. It's not just, you know, one or two preachers or an editor or two uh, here and there. I mean, this thing's massive. It'll be in the schools. It'll be in the colleges. There'll be sermons, editorials, and uh, even plays. You go to a theater, and there's a play. You know, a play's going on that has been skillfully and persuasively persuasively bolded to fit this scenario. So the public is, you know, constantly, it's okay, it's for your own good, it's beneficial. And that's what David Rockefeller actually uh, saying in his book Memoirs. Uh, after uh, David Rockefeller, if you get that, page 405 that Dr. Stan mentioned, if you get that book and you're reading and it says he's part of the secret cabal and conspiring and so forth and so on, right under that, in the mid of the page, there's a, a sort of subtitle and it's called Political Paranoia, Political Paranoia. And when you read what's under that, the bottom half of that page 405, what David Rockefeller says is that, uh, yeah, we do exist. Yeah, there is a secret cabal. Yeah, we are conspiring against the best interest. But David Rockefeller says, all you people out there, all those people out there reading this book and across the land who think that this is bad, well, you're mistaken. That's political paranoia. He says, yeah, we exist, but we're good. We're good for you. You know, this is for your own good. It's for the best interest of the country and for you. Well, not, only that, but not only that, but he talks about, look, he says, look, we've raised the living standards of other countries throughout the world. You know, yep. how would you have done it? Look, what a great job we've done in other countries. And, of course, this is right, written in, 19, in 2002. And they had raised the living standards in India. And they had raised the living standards in China. And people were better off in those countries, of course. And suddenly we were on the verge of the the contract beginning lowering the living standards in America, certainly, <laughs> and getting to the point where we are today with a real unemployment rate, according to John Williams. If you take the unemployed, the underemployed, those giving up for work, or those who are on disability, uh, now over 12, 11, 12 percent of our uh, percent populations on disability of one sort or another, I think 11, 10, 11 million people, something like that. But basically, he says, you know, but, but look how much better off people are, certainly in 2002. But ladies and gentlemen, what's coming to ahead is going to be a nightmare. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, yeah, it will be. And uh, uh, as, he, as Gent was writing this about the sermons by preachers, the editorials, and so forth and so on, uh, there's another book that the Radio Liberty has, and it's called The uh, uh, 200, year, 200 Year Education Chronologies called Chronology of Education uh, with Quotable Quotes. And I wrote that. It's only about 135 pages, but it has a 3,000-item index. And one of the things that I included in there is, I believe it's from the early 60s, where the head of the NEA, uh, who's all part of this stuff, uh, the, the head of it is, not you know every single little teacher across the land, but the, you know, the top people with the NEA, National Education Association, is saying, well, education we see it as a leveling process. And that's what Dr. Stan was just saying, sort of redistribute the wealth. You know, we're going to use education as a leveling process. 
Now, of course, you would think, well, they, they just mean here. No, no, no. This is an international. This The power elite is international for a world uh, socialist government. And so when they say a leveling process, they mean a leveling process, like the wages. You know, it'll wind up where the wages of Americans, which are being pummeled and caused to go down, will be dropped so low that the third world can be raised, and that too it will be a global level leveling process. And to do that, of course, you have to have this world economic system that Dr. Stan mentioned. One world government, a one world financial system, and of course, the destruction of Christianity. Have you noticed how they've changed the music in our churches? How they've changed the message, the, the message that our, our ministers preach? Well, we'll be back in just a moment to wrap up the program. Our guest, Dr. Dennis Cuddy, one of the best formed and stimulating speakers we have. Well, Dr. Cuddy, you've got three minutes to wrap up the program. Well, uh, I'll just conclude because we're at the end of part three, and we'll pick up with uh, part four uh, next time. I'll just conclude uh, picking up on your statement about it's not just the one world government, the one world economic system, but the one world religion, and show how these people are all still part of that. Uh, you have to remember Nelson Rockefeller's protege was Henry Kissinger, and he he would be you know handling the Republican side, the, the Nixons, and so forth. And uh, David Rockefeller's uh, protege was uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, and he was the one who would be handling Jimmy Carter, and he's an advisor also now to uh, Barack Obama and, and so forth. So they're the agents. They're sort of like the John J. the successors to John J. McCoy. Uh, that's what they are. But Nelson's son, Stephen Rockefeller, in terms of his one world religion, he actually drafted uh, something called the Earth Charter. Now you're saying, well, okay, so he drafted this thing. But what you have to remember is it wasn't just he had nothing better to do up at Middlebury, Connecticut, than to draft this thing for uh, for Gorbachev and uh, Marie Strong. Uh, this goes way back into the 1950s, the late 1950s. And I put this quote in my book, a couple of books, I think, uh, where it's called Mid-Century Challenge to America. And in there, it's by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. And they say, history has given to us the job of having a new world order. And, of course, you think, you know, well, political, economic, and so forth. But the first one, the first one they mentioned is spiritual. Spiritual. Now you're thinking, what, what's Rockefeller got to do with spiritual? Well, remember, if you're going to have this one world system, not only do you have to have a one world government, one world economy, you have to have a one world religion. And so that's what he did. And when he uh, wrote that Earth Charter for Maurice Strong and Gorbachev, they, both of them, those two men, literally said, this is going to be like a new Ten Commandments. And they actually placed it in something uh, the, uh, it's called the Ark of Hope. And if you look at it, it's modeled after the Ark of the Covenant. So it's very clear that they see this as the basis for the new religion to come. And the new religion to come, of course, has economic aspects because the Earth Charter has redistributed the wealth uh, internally and externally, within nations and among nations. So in this new religion, it has an economic component to the religion. So this is how it all interconnects. And that's uh, the one thing I want to, to bring home. And the Rockefellers, of course, are in on that as well, the new world religion, as well as new, uh, the one world, new world order, world economy, and world government. So that's how it all connects, all fits together, and how the Rockefellers are involved in this. And the secret Nazi plan is coming about today. That is a subset of the larger power elite plan. There's various aspects to it, like Dr. Stan mentioned about bringing the 1,000 scientists over here. They had all Operation Eagle Flight uh, was bringing... Uh, hold that thought. Hold the thought. We're out of time, Dennis. Okay. Well, Dr. Stan, I guess it's been Dr. Dennis Cuddy. Dennis, thank you so very much for being with us, and we'll look forward to having you again next week. Okay, thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Right, of course, Dr. Cuddy, simply if you have, uh, one of the finest uh, students, one of the finest researchers we have. If you haven't read his books, why give us a call, and we'll list all those that are in print we carry. Our number is 1-800-544-8927, but if I could suggest two of them, one would be the power elite and the secret Nazi plan. The other would be simply the 
quotations of 200 years of quotations. Give us a call. Get the information out. If you'd like to verify what we're saying, we carry David Rockefeller's memoirs. We tell you about how his daughters to go down to, to visit a good old Uncle Fidel. Well, they don't call him Uncle Fidel, but why would David Rockefeller's daughters go down to visit this ruthless murderer? He is a murderer. He's killed a lot of people personally. So why would they so they go to visit him? David Rockefeller's memoir is available by calling 1-800-544-8927. If you want to hear recently my interview with the Ambassador Smith, who was actually the American ambassador to Cuba in 1959, it's called World Revolution. World Revolution, it's an excellent DVD. And then, of course, you need to read my book, Brotherhood of Darkness. That's Brotherhood of Darkness. And they're all available by calling 1-800-544-8927. Now, certainly, my ministry, Radio Liberty, is primarily listener-supported. And if you're out there in the listening audience, you're in a position to help us. Well, I would appreciate your calling, and you can join the Radio Liberty family. And if you're not in a position to help, then we ask you to pray for Radio Liberty for our provision and protection, because this is truly a spiritual battle for the souls of men and the survival of Christian civilization. People can't believe that this whole system would collapse, but I would say if God is just, he's going to bring his judgment on America and on the American people, not because of what they've done, because of what they haven't done, because they haven't spoken out against evil. They're not concerned that we're financing the rebels over there, because they're not telling you we're financing the rebels, but we're financing the rebels over there in Syria through our surrogates and as in the Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Why do you think if we're really concerned about democracy and freedom that we maintain the Saudi Arabians in, in power? Basically, they cut off people's hands and feet. They cut off people's heads. They castrate men publicly. They stone women to death if they're caught in adultery. This is Saudi Arabia, our great democratic counterpart over there, who, of course, is carrying out our direction and helping to fund the, the rebels there in Syria that have now killed over 93,000 innocent civilians. And why do we ever talk about that? Why do we ever talk about the fact that we have special forces troops in, in both Jordan and Turkey who are arming and training the rebels over there? I mean, who's financing the rebels? Do you really think that we have been supplying the weapons over there? And the Syrian people, over four million of them, have been driven from their homes. Their homes don't exist anymore. Large parts of Syria are in rubble. And basically, thanks to American foreign policy. You need to get the information on what's going on. Our telephone number, 1-800-544-8927. Our webpage is radioliberty.com. We hope that you'll get my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, which will take you into the spiritual forces that control both political parties and make mockery of the electoral process. That's Brotherhood of Darkness. It's, it's it's between 60 and 100,000 copies out there, and it has an impact. It's changed people's lives. I hope it will change your life. Again, our number, 1-800-544-8927. Now you can go to our webpage, radioliberty.com. That's radioliberty.com. You can hear certainly our radio programs there. You can listen uh, to at least four hours a day of our programs uh, and live. And then, of course, you can listen to the archive programs 24 hours a day. You can watch our DVDs. So you can read our newsletters and you can read my Population Control Agenda monograph and find out about the genocidal policies your tax dollars are financing. And remember, men and women become accomplices to the evils they fail to oppose. Please pray for Radio Liberty for our provision and our protection till Monday. May the Lord be with you.